That was awesome. I need to hear that first thing in the morning, <laughs> driving to work, yeah. just who I am in Christ. Well, it's so good to be together tonight. I just want to look at you for a second. Precious, precious family, family of God. Is it hot in here? <laughs> oh, man. I'll be fine after I speak. Everything will come back to normal. But I'm just giving an introduction tonight, so um, it's so good to, to gather. And I was just thinking, um, what I need more than anything is uh, church. I need God's mind, his perspective. I need to um, look on things above. So that's what I'm going to share about today. If you have your Bibles, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I've had an interesting week, an interesting few weeks. I think we could all identify. Um, and this portion that I'm going to share from, it just um, really was, it, it was like a personal uh, rhema for me, a revival. It just spoke to me in my situation, so I'm praying that it will do the same for you. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your eternal word. We thank you for um, all that you've done for us in Christ. Thank you for delivering us from the kingdom of darkness and translating us into the kingdom of God's dear son. We thank you for this place tonight, your people. Thank you that we're loved, that we are redeemed. We are a blessed people. We, we are rejoicing today that our names are written in the book of life. By faith, uh, you've um, done so much for us, God, and we just pray you just help us to uh, with an eternal perspective as we look at our lives and try to figure things out, we pray that your thoughts tonight would just uh, be exactly what we need. Bless Pastor Shibley as he brings the main course tonight. Bless this appetizer, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, uh, my wife was just uh, yesterday listening to uh, a message. It was actually a class, Pastor Stevens, back in 1999, and she shared this joke that he shared, and I, you know, passed her with his jokes, uh, so I just wanted to start with a joke. Uh, and this, is, this will remind you of Pastor if you knew him. So he said a man went in for a job interview, and he gave his resume to the interviewer, and the interviewer was looking at it, and he says, this doesn't look good. <laughs> and he says, what do you mean? He says, well, the first job you were fired second job, you were fired, and the third job, you were fired. And the guy goes, no, no, that's not bad, because what that says about me is that I'm not a quitter. <laughs> uh, isn't that good? Like, he turned it right around. I'm sure the guy looked at him like, are you serious? And maybe he was, if it was, well, it's a joke, so... But I love that. I love the fact that, uh, and what I wanted to speak for a few minutes about is why we don't quit. And there's a verse here, actually three verses, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. It says, therefore, or I'm going to, I have the new King James, I'm going to read the King James, for which cause we faint not. My, my translation says, therefore we do not lose heart. And I was thinking, why do I come to church? Why do I draw near to the body and to hear the word of God? It's so I don't faint. I don't know about you, but um, have you ever fainted, like actually fainted? I mean, it's a very embarrassing thing. I, I, I was trying to think of, you know, to tell a fainting story, but I know I've fainted before. <laughs> Maybe not physically, but spiritually. Fainting is like very embarrassing. You sort of wake up and people are around you looking at you. And I remember Pastor Justin Schaller at a lunch wrap talked about the fainting goats. Did you ever hear the story? He said, Google it. And I, I was at my computer, so of course, immediately I Googled. And these goats are just normal in a field, and then the person just does something to scare them. And immediately they faint. I mean, they just fall down like they're dead one after another after another. And he said, we are like these goats. Fainting is, 
it's a part of our life. And um, in this chapter, there are so many reasons why we, we could faint. But Paul is saying that we don't lose heart. We don't faint. And, and this is what we're concentrating on these days in our church is about the renewed mind. We're talking about this revival, this empowering that God does. I think it was last semester in a class, we were having a rap, and one of the students said, um, Pastor Cannon, what would you say of, of all the things you can get in Bible college? What is like the most important thing to get? And I, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> so I said, I think it's this encouragement, which is this enheartment, and it's this strength that God puts in your heart. It's whatever that word from God is to keep your heart from fainting. This is what we get in Bible college. That's why, why we come. And really what I'm talking about tonight is an eternal perspective, eternal viewpoint. It's so important that we see the big picture because we are, as, as human beings, it's amazing. Our mind is constantly going. We're trying to figure out what is going on in my life. And, and Paul said here, listen to this, therefore we do not lose heart, or for which cause we faint not, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. How's your outward man? <laughs> oh boy. Though my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. In verses uh, 8 and 9 in this chapter, Paul talks about being troubled, being perplexed, being persecuted, being cast down. And this is our experience. And chapter 5, he talks about this tent life, this groaning that we have burdened. And this is, this is our, our outward man perishing. And it's a reality. There are so many reasons why we get discouraged. There are so many reasons we're disappointed. Have you ever had your plan or your dream just smashed? You hear about people who come home from church and their house is on fire. You know what, it's, this is a reality and I thank God that we come to church and we hear this truth that life is not easy. It is, it's, it's, this is a broken world and we are broken people, but we don't lose heart. We don't despair. We're, we might be discouraged, but we come and there's a renewal that's taken place. And I was thinking about looking in the, the bathroom mirror versus looking in the mirror of the Word of God. <laughs> looking in the bathroom mirror. And truthfully, as a man, you know, you really don't look so long. I mean, I don't. I do what I need to do, and then I'm out of there. And I forget pretty quickly what I look like. <laughs> but it's not, I'm thinking of, you know, this, I have glasses now. I never had glasses. Now I can't live without them. This is like a reality now. Everything is winding down. Everything is, I mean, this is like, this is the world that we live in. This is normal. But I... I could, I could really look at this human condition, this, this uh, body, that's this outward man perishing. But Paul says, if you did that, you would definitely lose heart. You would, you would faint. We would faint. But what does he say? He says, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I have, a, I have a Bible at home. It's, it's 26 translations. So I, whenever I'm studying, I always look up. So when I, I thought, light affliction? Really, Lord? Light affliction? So I looked up in all the different translations. And I think what God is saying, it's short compared to eternity. It's momentary. It's transitory. It's this will pass. Uh, even though it's very hard for us and very real, his, his burden, the burden that he gives to us, it's working for us. It's really working for us. I heard a beautiful, I actually read a testimony of a, a woman was ministering to her friend who was dying of cancer. 
Is there water here? Okay. Let's drink this. I'm shaking. So this woman was really at the end. She's in her, she's in her bed that she didn't have many, many hours left to live. And this woman comes in. She says, how are you doing? And this girl says, I can't even believe that I'm still alive. Her bones were so brittle, she says, nobody can touch me except Jesus without breaking me. And I thought, what a great statement that is. And then the woman said, how is your faith? And she goes, she says, I've lost a lot of faith in certain things. And then she said this, faith in the temporal world, faith in my ability, faith in my will, faith in my plans. But she said, but my strength in God my faith in God is very strong. So I was just thinking about this weakening of our strength in the way, this wasting down the, the troubles that God allows us to go through. It's working. It's working. And when I think about this, why trials? Why? And it's, there's a purifying. I think this is what Paul was saying. It's like we think that we're being incinerated. We think that it's like eliminating us completely, but actually it's causing us to lose faith in the things that we so easily trust in and trust only in God because it's only in God. It's only in him that we find our satisfaction. And it's like, I'm a horrible camper. I hate camping as I avoid it at all costs. Some people love it, but I think the purpose of camping is it's specifically designed to make you long to go home, you know? <laughs> just thinking about, oh, just to have a refrigerator, a nice bed. And I think that our life on this planet, this is a camping time. And God's saying, you know, really, this isn't your home. You are made for another world. This is a time of preparation. This is a time when I'm, I'm working things in. So then it's finally it says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So this was my thought. This um, eternal look, this looking at, not at the mirror, but looking at the word. And the word of God, I love one of my favorite poets, George Herbert, he says, he, he had a poem about the Word of God, and he said it's a, it's a thankful glass, meaning that it's a, when you look at the Word, it makes you thankful. And then he said it, the, the, um, the lookers are mended. Their eyes are mended by looking at it, and it washes what it shows. So it's like we come to the Word, and I, sometimes it is like fire. It's like the eyes of the Lord purifying white, holy fire, but there's... There's this washing also that happens. And I was just thinking about my eyes, how, and I had a beautiful conversation during the convention with, uh, with uh, Auntie and Paula, who just came back from Israel. And they were just, I mean, they were shining and talking about uh, how close we are to Christ's second coming. It was so real. And, and they mentioned to me a message that Pastor Ben had preached about um, from Song of Solomon, I couldn't find the verse exactly, but it was sort of like we have one eye on the Lord and one eye on our situation in this life. It's like not totally, it's sort of like the chameleon, if we had our eyes that could look in two directions. And, but this focus on, on the eternal is, I believe, this is the key this is why we don't lose heart, because this is not the end. This is, this is um, all just preparing us for eternity. There's a home that Christ is preparing for us. We, we are his children. I heard uh, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones at one point in his life, he's in a wheelchair, and they say, do you miss it? Do you miss the preaching? How, how do you, what do you think about yourself now that you can't do what you used to do? And he said, Luke um, chapter 10 Verse 20, I think it was, I wrote it down here, 1020. He said, the disciples came back and Christ says, don't rejoice that demons are subject to you. Don't rejoice in the miracles. Don't rejoice in all the things you do. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. And this is sort of like this eternal perspective. It really doesn't matter 
all that matters really is the eternal. So, so in closing, I was thinking about um, Elisha with his servant, and the enemies are all around them. And Elisha prays, Lord, open his eyes that he may see that those that are with us are more than those that are with them. And God opened his eyes, and he saw, he saw horses and chariots of fire surrounding Elisha. And I just, that really hit me, surrounding Elisha. So much of what we go through is like atmospheric, it's demonic, it's like kingdoms we don't even understand. And God, please, like, touch my eyes, anoint my eyes, open my eyes, lift my head to see eternal realities and to walk in those things like they are real because they are real. They're more real than what we see with our natural eyes. And, and God did it for the servant, and he saw it. And, and then the other one was Hagar. Hagar's despairing. She's, her son is dying. She's in the, in the wilderness. And then beautifully in uh, Genesis chapter 21, God opens her eyes, and she sees a well. And so this is what I would say to you in the midst of your trials. Um, there's a well. There's, there's a promise. There's a God, eternal God, whose eye is on you. He cares for you. He knows what you're going through. And he's saying, realize that this is all eternal. This is going to have an eternal weight of glory attached to it. These things that I'm allowing in your life, we don't even understand, but understand this, that we, we're to look at those things and not at the outward only. We're to walk by faith and not by sight. So that's my word tonight. Amen. Amen. Hi, everybody. You look good with, passive, uh, with glasses, Pastor Cannon. Very good, see? You're very good with glasses. Would you stand, please, and turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 17? Thank you, Pastor Cannon. That was beautiful and uh, thought-provoking. Genesis 16, uh, and, and verse uh, 1. <clears throat> now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. She had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid, perhaps... I shall obtain children by her. <clears throat> and Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her, hus her, her husband, Abram, to be his wife after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abraham, my wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace. <clears throat> and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. <clears throat> and when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she, fret, uh, she fled from her presence. Father, I thank you for this evening and for the word of God. And I pray this evening that it would speak to each and every one of us in our own individual way as we need to hear from you tonight once again in your precious name, amen. You may be seated. If you were gonna make a title for tonight's message, it would be, Don't Live in the Guilt of Wrong Decisions. And actually, a lot of it has to do a little, you know, somewhat with what Pastor Cannon was saying as well, because Sarah, in this particular case, seemed to have made a, a bad decision. You know, she, um, 
she gave, uh, you know, Sarah, Sarah gave Hagar to his, her husband. And it was her doing, it was her idea to do this thing. Um, of course, the idea of multiple wives was common in that day. It was um, not an idea that originated with God. Uh, Lamech in Genesis chapter 4 was the first one who was recorded to have had two wives or more, but he had two. Uh, and then maybe, maybe it was a tradition in this sense or a, um, something common that strong, wealthy men, you know, could have multiple wives and therefore have many offspring. Um, but the interesting thing, you wonder, well, what did God think about this? What did God think about this? Because really, Abraham was a one-woman man, and Sarah was a one-man woman. Uh, but, and then later, we know that she would regret the thing that she had done. Uh, and we know this is actually what God's plan is, right? One woman, one man. Uh, Jesus, um, I'm sorry, the Lord, in Genesis chapter 2, and verse 18, the Lord said, it's not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable or comparable to him. And then it says in verse 19, out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the fields and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh in its place. This is not what I learned in biology class, by the way. Uh, but this is what the Bible says uh, in its place. And then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It's interesting. Yeah, I didn't learn that in biology class. Uh, it's not taught, actually, in biology classes, certainly not in the public schools and not in many private schools either. Uh, this is, um, you know, interesting. But, you know, it depends on what you believe uh, in terms of the Bible. Like, I believe the Bible. And I know that you believe the Bible, most of you, but maybe not all of you. Maybe you have trouble or you're not understanding. You're wondering, how could that be? How could, you know, God take a rib out of a man and make a woman out of one rib? And I think, well, he made the entire universe out of nothing. So I think with the rib, at least he had a head start, you know? And so it didn't take him seven days. And so that is how it is. But I mean, I'm joking, right? But... People have legitimate concerns, but I would say this. I would say read the Bible. Read other portions. Read, go to Answers in Genesis, some of these different places where you can start to learn what God has done and what reason there is. Read John Sabo's books, you know, and understand these different things about the Bible, you know, and the truth and compare it to what the world has to offer. You know, the world often talks in authoritative ways. But they don't really have, or I say the world, the world scientists, whatever, uh, talk in authoritative ways. But really, most of what they say when it comes to this type of creation and biology and evolution is very much conjecture that has been brought into a current consensus of thought in our world today. But, you know, uh, bottom line, though, it says in verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Uh, David had many wives. Solomon had many wives. But was this God's will really? Was it really God's will? Or, was David, or, or did David and Solomon and the other uh, kings, were they driven by lust? Uh, uh, they also maybe had a fear that they would not have an heir, and so they wanted to have many sons. But... Um, we see these kind of things, but we know uh, what happened. We know that God had made a promise to Abraham, uh, to, I'm sorry, to, to David. And it's in 1 Samuel chapter 7. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come 
from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This was a promise by God. And so the promise was there. The promise didn't say anything about multiple wives. The promise didn't say anything about God, help, I'm sorry, David or Solomon helping God make sure that there would be an heir because we know, I mean, we know, we conjecture, we think this is what they were doing. This was the current consensus. This was the tradition. This was the general practice of kings. And also with Abraham and Sarah, Sarah's idea was not unique. This was not a unique idea when a woman could not have a child or when a woman had children, but they wanted more children, but she couldn't have them, that they would present another woman to the husband for a second wife so that they could have more kids. But God did not need this, it seems, right? God's promise to Abraham and to Sarah was that they would have a child. God's promise to David was that he would always have an heir on the throne. And so was it, what was the reason that people thought that God needed help? Why were they trying so hard to help God? What's wrong, Sarah? What are, what are you thinking? What are you believing? God doesn't need our help to fulfill his eternal promises, does he? I don't think so. He didn't need our help to create the world. He didn't need our help you know, to do the things that he did. God did it. But I want you to know that Jesus, back to marriage, he affirms what Genesis chapter 2 says about marriage, um, that it is a one man, that it is one woman. In Matthew 19, he answered and he said to them, have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them, and now listen, male and female. This is how God made them, male and female. And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, quoting Genesis chapter 2. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. This is what it is. One man, one woman. Not one man and three women. Not anything else. Nothing else but one man and one woman. So really we know then that Sarah, by demanding that Abraham have a child with Hagar, she was wrong. And this was sin. And maybe this was the accepted practice of the day. But Abraham, he also sinned when he uh, went along with her by taking Hagar into his bed. I mean, this was wrong. And we know that it was wrong. We appreciate, you know, the truth of the Bible. We appreciate the candid nature in which the Bible was written. Because in these pages, we often always see some reflection of ourselves. Because we have the same nature that Sarah had the same nature that Abraham had. In, in effect, we all have sinned, as the Bible says in Romans chapter 3. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Every one of us have turned our backs on God in one way or another. But just as, just as later, uh, after Abram and Sarah, uh, David and Solomon took other wives it was allowed by God, but ultimately it was not the perfect will of God. And even Samuel warned of these things in 1 Samuel chapter 8. He warned that this would be bad. He warned that having a king would be bad because they would do such things as this. In Genesis chapter 17 and verse 15, it says, Then Sarah said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her, and I will also give you a son by her. This was after Ishmael was already born. I will give you a son by her, then I will bless her, and she shall be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed, and he said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. So how often do we want to make 
you know, fit our lifestyle into God's plan. Have you ever wondered that? Our lifestyle that is not godly, our, 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 our lifestyle that was wrong. So often we want God just to say, isn't it okay, Lord, that we do this? It's okay, right? I mean, you don't mind, do you, God? I mean, God allows us to do a lot of things. He allows us a lot of things in our life that happen. But it is not always his will, and often it is not. God saves us. God, when he does, we call it justification. There is this process of sanctification where God whittles away things in our lives that are not pleasing to him. Uh, we call it growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not always fun. It's not always easy. Often it's very hard. And often we are trying to fit uh, you know, a square into a, a square peg into a round hole, and it just doesn't fit. But we take the hammer and we just hammer the darn thing in. Have you ever done that? I do this stupid stuff all the time. You know, when you can't get something to fit, like some plastic clip, and and you just, I, I think this is maybe a guy thing, more or less. You know, and you push and push until it breaks, and then you realize maybe that was not where it went. And uh, I'm going to learn that trick one day to be patient and to think about things like that. But, you know, Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God, I know you want it to be this supposed child that's coming. I know, but I don't, I, I, it's been a long time and I don't see it happening. I don't see the change coming in my life. I don't see how it could happen based on my past. I don't see how it could happen based, in this case, on physiology. I don't see how it can happen. But of course, Jesus says with God, with man, I'm sorry, with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. This is something that we need to keep in our minds when we can't shed things from our life, when we want God to act in certain ways, when we know he's, he commanded us to act in another way, when we want to act in a certain way. God is not worried about his promises. God can make them happen, and he will. But in this particular case, Abraham did not want to wait any longer. He loved Ishmael, and he wanted to see Ishmael be that promised child. Then God said, no, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him. The covenant of Abraham would now be established with Isaac and his descendants after him. So both Abraham and Isaac knew what the right thing to do was. Abraham and Sarah, I'm sorry. Uh, and they knew what they should believe. The problem that they had was exercising that same faith. Exercising the faith that they saw in the book. That's our problem. We have a book. They didn't have a book. But exercising the faith that they understood came from the eternal God. And that is the problem that we have. And part of it is because there is so much pressure on people today. There was pressure on Abraham in his day to have a child. There was pressure on him because he had all these riches that he wanted to pass down to somebody. He didn't know how long he was going to live. He didn't know how long Sarah was going to live. But he knew one thing, that he had to make this legacy go to his heir. And his heir, he thought, would be Ishmael. But God said, no, it's something that you cannot see right now, but it's coming. And so this pressure was hard for him. He wanted to do the right thing. He had tried several times to do what he thought was the right thing, starting with Hagar, but it wasn't the right thing. I was talking to uh, one of my daughter's friends uh, recently. We were driving somewhere in the car, and we were talking about you know, silly stuff. But then we talked about boys a little bit. And nobody, well, she, was, she said, oh, she said, Mr. Kim, I'm not... I'm not interested in boys right now. <laughs> I said, well, why? What's going on? And she told me that, you know, in her school, she's going to be um, a senior in high school, <clears throat> that she had two boyfriends, but that she had to break up with both of them because uh, both of them wanted to have sex with her, premarital sex. And, she, uh, and I'm like, oh, that's good. That's good, right? You know, she was upset because she fell into that same 
thing two times, but she didn't fall to the pressure. Instead, she broke up with them. And I thought, that is amazing. You did the right thing. Good for you. Uh, you know, but at the same time, she's like, yeah, but I really would like to have a boyfriend, you know? One that wouldn't put that kind of pressure on me. One that would just enjoy me for who I am. And, and of course, that will happen. I know. I know that will happen for her someday. But, you know, it's so true in many ways that oftentimes we cave to the pressure. We cave uh, and we, you know, we can't take it anymore. And this is what happened to Abraham and Isaac. They, Abraham, I keep saying that, and Sarah, they cave to the pressure, you know. And I think about the whole thing with premarital sex. I mean, it's, it is hard for some people. It is hard, too, you know, when people make the wrong decisions. And then it's very hard to backtrack on that decision. I've seen people make the wrong decisions by beginning to take heroin, for example. And, you know, don't do it. That's what I say, you know. Don't do it. Once that needle goes into your arm, you have no idea the door that you have opened. And, and, you know, it goes from the needle to another needle to emptying your bank account to losing your job to ending up on the street homeless and toothless uh, to be going back and forth into rehabilitation programs never to really overcome in so many ways. I see, we've seen it happen so many times. The same with uh, different sex addictions. The same with drinking. Don't take that first drink because you don't know where it's going to lead you to. Uh, it is foolishness, really. But I understand that there's a lot of pressure. But I would rather have the pressure now than the regrets and the difficulties later. You know what I mean? I mean, there are so many difficulties. There is so much pressure. Look at the difficulties that Abraham would have because, and Sarah would have simply because of that one bad decision. And then Abraham later on would, you know, he crazily, you know, he had already offered his wife to one king, and then he would offer his wife to Abimelech. And I can imagine them, you know, I can imagine Sarah and what she's thinking, you know, you know, asking God, you know, when am I going to get what I need? You promised to supply all our needs. And I see that happening in the lives of people in my church. And I see that happening to people where they, they cave to the pressure because they want things, but they don't want to wait for them because they can't see it. Just like Abraham could not see it. He could not see it. So he, he thought, what is more true, that or God? You know, the thing that I need, God says that he will supply all my needs. I don't see it happening. First Peter says to cast all your cares upon him, though, for he cares for you. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, come unto me, all that labor and are heavy laden. He says, take my yoke upon me. He says, learn of me, for I am meek and I am lowly. And you'll find rest in your soul. This is what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to be patient. But we're just looking to move the process forward, you know, so often. It's like, you know, you've got to be patient. You've also got, even in business, there are so many temptations to follow what the world would have for you. Um, Christians have always been under pressure, though. Since the time of the apostles, since the time of the apostle Paul, uh, we've always been under pressure to conform to the world as the series that Pastor Schaller has been teaching in Romans, be not conformed unto the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But this transformation, you know, is something that we have to think about. It is something that we have to believe in. It is, it is faith. Otherwise, you've got the world all around us, the cosmos, you know, both good and bad, they are around us. And what is the world anyway? You know, it's the planet. You know, the world is the things around us. The world is the people around us, but also it is the current consensus of thoughts. And that's different sometimes in every country. And we see politically the current consensus of thought. We see the consensus of thought, pop culture. You know, it's all around us. The, the, news, the magazines at the grocery store checkout, you know, that's my favorite thing, you know. Well, well, oh, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I want to see what happened to so-and-so, you know. It's all so funny. Which alien landed where and, and all this kind of thing, you know? you know. But these are the things that are accepted by the masses, this pop culture, politics, public opinion. 
your friend's advice. This is cosmos sometimes. This is the world that the Bible warns us against. Sometimes even our parents' advice. Not, not you, but, you know, some parents. Um, but, you know, you know, we're not required to listen to the world. It's not our duty to listen. We don't have to listen. We shouldn't listen. And I want to warn you, don't listen. The world is trying to shame you right now as a Christian. It's trying to shame you for believing what you believe in. It is the current consensus of thought. You have to change. You have to become like the world. You have to accept the things that the Bible never says to accept. But you, you need to do it. And I don't care which news channel it is, if it's conservative, if it's left, if it's right, if it's whatever, upside down. They all say the same thing, it seems like. You've got to accept what's going on. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says not to love the world. It says, do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. And if anyone loves the world, that the love of the Father is not in him. Well, that puts a little fear in me. I don't want to love the world. I don't want to be part of this current consensus of thought that just moves and changes. And, 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 but it always never goes to where the word of God is. It always goes further away from what the Bible says. For this is why, though, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it is not of the Father, but of the world. These things that we see, this current consensus of thought, it is not of the Father, it is of the world. And the Bible says the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God, Pastor Cannon, abides forever. Abides forever. Is that amazing? Sarah and Abraham, they both wanted to please God, but they thought they needed to compromise to do it. You need some help, Lord. We can do it, please. Abraham was saying it, please. If only the promise could come through Ishmael. If only. You know, I remember I had that moment. You've had that moment before, you know. You know, you want to marry the girl that's not saved or the guy that's not saved. But you know that you can change him, you know. You know that once you get married, you know, it can happen. Yeah, don't, don't, that is the world, baby. Hey, God, kids, young people. Old, hey, my son's getting married. How do you like that? That's amazing, right? I know. That's amazing. But this is the thing. <laughs> we got to let God change people. We can't change people, right? That is a big deception right there. That is a big deception. It almost happened to me until I was one person in a congregation of a thousand, and it seemed like God was speaking right to me from the pastor, and I don't even think he knew me. I'm like, whoa. And then I went and I broke up with the girl that day, that afternoon. I drove about 75 miles. And boy, that was hard. I was depressed for a very long time. <laughs> I even tried to call her that following summer, but she cut me off. Yay, God. <laughs> Yay, God. <laughs> right? Because who knew waiting in the wings was Casey Bright? You know what I mean? That's right. And that was what? You see, this is it, though. God's timing is not always our timing. Sarah and Abraham had the timing off. God was not ready. They needed to go through some more things before they did it. They needed not to compromise, but they needed to learn to be patient. To be patient. Don't worry about tomorrow. Okay? Okay? Jesus says today has enough worries of its own, and it's so true, right? Peter and the apostles, they did not compromise. Remember the Pharisees in Acts chapter 5 went after them, and they told, hey, listen, hey, do whatever you want. You preach, have a good time, teach the people. Just don't mention the name of that guy, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, right? That's so, Hey, do whatever you want, just don't mention Jesus. Then Peter and the apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Man, we need to teach that to ourselves. We need to write that on our foreheads maybe and then look backwards and then look in the mirror in the morning, Pastor. Then we'll have something to look at. We ought to obey God rather than men. I believe in tattoos now, Pastor. What was that right there? That's a joke. That's a joke. Do not tattoo that on your head. Okay. 
But, you know, we will be challenged to change our beliefs. We always are, aren't we? I get challenged all the time in a lot of different ways, just to try to run a Christian service at our church in a certain way. I got Christians that challenge me. You know, I'm like, really? Here. It's like giving a kid the keys to the car. Here, go ahead. Try. You know, see if you can make it out of the driveway. But, you know, it's like (laughs) we are always going to be challenged, and we should understand that it's going to happen. But, you know, we can't be afraid to answer back. The key is, for us as Christians, is to know what we believe. Do you know what you believe? And you not only need to know what you believe, but you need to know why you believe what you believe. And we need to show our convictions, not just in our words, but also in our lifestyle. It's important. We need to say no. We need to let our peers see that we are not going to go to that place that they want to go to. We're not going to go watch a football game in a bar. We're not going to take that chance. We're not going to risk not just our testimony, but our own temptations. You know, sometimes we have to answer people back with truth, whether that's a brother in Christ that is maybe trying to tempt us away or somebody else, whether it's the world, whether it's someone who's challenging us in our Christianity for some reason. Don't be afraid if you have to set someone back on their heels a little bit. But be ready to answer for your faith. Be ready. Be kind. Be loving. Be merciful. Be forgiving. Okay? But don't compromise. Don't compromise the truth of the Bible. I, I mean, you know what I'm saying. I, I, you know, I don't want to offend people in that sense. I don't need to offend people. I, it's not my job. I'm not going to sit out and yell at people on the street and call them names because of the way they live. That is not what God has called me to, by any means, by any stretch. But at the same time, I'm going to believe what I believe. And I'm going to say what I want to say based on what the Word of God says. That's why we also need to be careful, uh, you know, who we associate with. And that means be careful who your friends are, you know. We don't want to let them change us either. We don't want to go out for a drink with the guys. We want to avoid those things because that, again, is part of the world. And it shouldn't be an acceptable behavior in our life because of what it leads to. But let's get back to the message, Genesis chapter 18. And they said unto him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. This is Genesis 18, 11. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and were well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the same manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure? My Lord being old also. And the Lord said to Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Remember the rib, Adam. At the appointed time I will return unto thee, uh, Abraham, unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah denied, saying, I didn't laugh. But God said, Yes, you did. Yes, you did. So Sarah, um, she definitely had a hard time grasping that that could actually happen. But a year later, it did. It happened. The promise that she couldn't wait for came despite her negativity, despite her unbelief. The promise came nonetheless. In Genesis 21, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord said unto Sarah as he had spoken, For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time for which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare unto him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son, being eight days old as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And God said, and Sarah said, God has made me to laugh so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should give in children suck, for I have borne him a son in his old age? God came through, didn't he? God came through. 
her past failure, okay, which, remember, she, this is what, it, her, she had a big failure in the past. It caused a lot of problems. The problems were magnified. Uh, this is what we have to understand, that our sin does not just affect us, does it? The decision that Sarah made to force God's hand, if you will, to force Abram's hand, if you will, and Hagar, it messed up a whole lot of people. It messed up a lot of situations. And that happens with us. When we make bad decisions, it affects other people in our lives. It affects us personally. It happens. But I got to say this. Her past failure did not accept the promises or the purpose of God. Amen? Because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has delivered us from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God, sending his son in the likeness of sin, condemns sin in the flesh. And the amazing thing about that statement from the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 is that we are set free from that condemnation. And that is another thing that we often forget. You know, Sarah could have continued to compromise. She could have allowed this thing, this sin, this past thing. Uh, she could have allowed it to walk side by side her in her new life with Isaac. Here's the promise, and here's the representation of the sin, Ishmael. She could have allowed that to continue, but she didn't. She didn't at all. Um, she overcame the guilt because it had to be a difficult decision. She overcame everything because she now just wanted to do the will of God. She had now realized that God was right the whole time. She had now realized that his promises was real the whole time. But here is Ishmael. And Ishmael represents that past sin. Ishmael is going to cause me some more problems if I leave it hanging around. It's going to mock me. And the child grew in verse 8 and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, which was born unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even Isaac. The world is not part of our future. Our past sin, the things that held us back, the things that caused the ripple effect damaging the lives of other people because of our decision. It's not going to stay. It's not going to remain. We're going to move on from that thing. But to be able to move on from that thing, we have to eliminate the guilt that reminds us of what we had done in the past. And the only way that we can do that is by receiving forgiveness from God. The only way that we can do that is to move forward with the promise that he's given us now. Because now we realize that he was right the whole time. Now we realize that we've got to move forward in grace. And we've got to put the past beside. You know what? We've got to get rid of it. You know what? We've got to take it of our, out of our phone. Don't call your old girlfriend. Leave her alone. You don't need her and she doesn't need you. Get rid of it. Get rid of those past associations that mock you. They remind, me of the, they remind you of the person that you were, not the person that God has made you to be today. Amen? You're a new creation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed. Behold, all things have become new. We want to live in that new creation, not in the things that mock us from the past, just as Ishmael was, but other people, they look and say, oh, no, hang on to that. Even Abraham, even Abraham is like, do we have to? Do we have to kick him out? Do we have to get rid of that old thing? And God said, yes, listen to your wife. She's right. She is right. Our past will mock us. We think we can't be a testimony anymore, maybe. Because of our past fails, I know people that have things in their life that remain, things that are hard to change. Uh, you know, the, the needle marks, the difficulties, the past, the, um, the, the associations. 
I don't even want to bring up all the different sins that have befallen all of us. Gosh, Lord, thank you. But we think that we can't be a testimony because of it. We think that we can't show the life of Christ because of the stuff that's behind us. We just have to keep it behind us. Our failures, they can either be an anchor holding us back, you know, or they can also be a catalyst for change. They can be a rocket fuel that sends us up into another orbit. They can be something fantastic, something that will set us far ahead because now as Sarah, we've realized the promise. We've realized that it was okay to get rid of Hagar. It was okay to get rid of Ishmael. It was a good thing. It's the thing that actually God wanted. He doesn't want us to be defeated by our past. We have to do this thing. We've got to look at that sin. We've got to look at that thing that's holding us back. If it's holding you back right now, deal with it. Take your boot and kick it out. Kick out the bondwoman and her son. Get rid of them. Get rid of everything that they represent. Put it behind you. Don't let it hold you back. Your past wants to hang around just to mock you. Your past wants to hang around just so that it can tie a rope to your leg and in a weak moment, it can pull you back into the muck. Don't keep those sentimental attachments. Get rid of them. It's over. Kick it out. Move on. God's got a better plan for you, amen? And he does. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in your lives. I, I see the difficulties. We are real people. We have real problems. We have real pasts. But it doesn't matter because we have a real God who's right there with the promises, right there waiting for us to move forward, right there wanting us to act in faith, right there ready to reward us with grace and love and fulfillments and refreshments in the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you that you love us so much. That even our past, Lord Jesus, the Bible says that you've cast it into the sea, Lord. You have cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. We don't have to worry about it anymore, Lord God. Thank you for deliverance. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Lord, thank you so much for tonight. If, if you are here this evening and maybe someone invited you, maybe you didn't know what you were getting into, maybe you did, but maybe you've never received Christ as your Savior. Maybe you don't even know what that means. It means to believe in him. It means to believe that Jesus is God and that he became man and he lived a life for 33 years that was perfect but offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Because we couldn't pay for our own sins. God had to do it for us. And he is calling you today. The Bible says that God loved you so much that he gave his only son, Jesus, that if you believe in him, you would not die eternally, but that you would have instead eternal life. I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're here this evening and you've never received Jesus as your Savior, and you would like to, you'd like to see your past sins washed away, and you would like to have a new life. Say this prayer. Say, dear Jesus, I believe in you. I receive you as my Savior. Say that prayer. Say it in your heart. Say it out loud if you want to. I don't Stand up and shout it if you want. It would be a great thing. If you're here today and you've never believed in Jesus, don't let another minute go by before you put your trust in him. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. I receive you as my Savior. If you've said that prayer, lift up your hands. Lift up your hands if you're believing for the first time tonight. I don't know who's here. I don't know if you're a member of the church. But if you are here and you've never believed in Jesus, raise your hand and believe in him today. Is there anybody tonight that's believing in Christ for the very first time? Anybody? Father, we thank you tonight for this message. And we thank you for blessing us with your word your presence, and your promises. In Jesus' name, amen.